All right, thank you all. Um, welcome to this talk. A um, little bit of a gruesome picture. It's not a background. This actually is the first slide of the talk. So um, that, that club on the right-hand side is actually called a maquitl. That is a, an ancient Aztec close quarter combat weapon. And the, uh, the things on the side are actually just uh, um, uh, obsidian. So obsidian is like a, a volcanic glass. And it's basically just a big piece of wood with volcanic glass uh, put into the side of it. And when you, when you chip obsidian in just the right way, it creates an edge that's sharper than a steel uh, razor blade. So pretty brutal uh, weapon. So the Aztecs actually were a trading empire, so you might not know this. Uh, the Aztecs were a trading empire. They lived on an island. Uh, they couldn't grow anything. They couldn't, uh, there was not enough places to, to hunt. So uh, they said, you know what, we'll be a trading empire. Everybody come over to our island. You're free to trade. We'll make it safe and we'll make it fair. So people came along. We said, leave your maquitals in, your, in the port. Come over and, uh, and, and if anybody's cheating you, just, just shout. So what would happen is if, uh, if you, you go to the market and if you think the market person is cheating or has like a, a, a fake weight or something like that, you can call the Aztec police over and the Aztec police were just Aztec warriors. And you could say, I think that person's cheating. The Aztec warriors had their own weights, standardized weights on their belt, and they would check there and then to see if the, uh, if the, the stall holder was cheating. And if they were cheating, you know, McQuittal comes out, down, and uh, you're not surviving that. But uh, the really uh, cool part of this story is if you called the police over and the market, the trader, wasn't cheating, you died. Right? I kind of like that story. Um, I tell that story uh, because of a couple of things. Um, a, it's a really fun story. Uh, B, um, when we talk about sustainability, I think we oftentimes just um, fluff over the reality of it. It's, it's life and death. I think that's one of the things I like to kind of bring back to these conversations. And also, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful story about measurement and about measurement is power. And really, this is a talk about power and about measurement. So my name is Asim Hussain. I'm the executive director of the Green Software Foundation, which I co-founded uh, over three years ago. We've grown from eight to 68 members in, in three years. We're a combination of nonprofits, uh, commercial enterprises, academia, and universities. We're part of the, the Linux Foundation family of foundations. Um, and our vision is a future where software has zero harmful environmental impacts. We're a standards and policy foundation, so we believe we're going to make that vision come true by creating standards and getting those standards adopted as policy. Uh, our most advanced and mature standard is something called the SCI, the Software Carbon Intensity Specification. It's carbon per something, so carbon per something. Uh, but the specification goes into a lot more detail as to you know, what to include in that calculation, how to compute it. This, if this is being recorded, this will hopefully be streamed at some point in the future. And on that streaming platform, the SCI score might be carbon per minute. That's what the SCI is all about. Um, version 1 reached consensus through all of our member organizations. We're a consensus-driven organization uh, end of last year. It then went through a, a, a bigger consensus process with, with ISO to then get approved from 175 countries. And it was approved late last year into ISO. And now we're seeing it commonly used in uh, research papers, corporate case studies. Um, some organizations, some CTOs are now starting to set the SCI as an org level KPI to optimize and to, and to go for. So what's next for the SCI? So, we don't really quite know. There's a, a SCI is quite generic, and therefore there's a lot of room for interpretation in different domains. But there's a lot of interest, as you can imagine, for an SCI for AI, kind of really locking that down. 
Um, there's also some conversations happening about SCI for blockchain, for gaming, for finance. This is the world that we're creating. Um, if you want to take advantage of anything that we do, it's all open source, it's all Creative Commons, you don't need to join. But all of our work in our standards and policy domain is, is only with our, with our members. So if you want to, if your organization, if you work for an organization that wants to join, uh, there's our join link, or you can reach out to me afterwards, or Sean, I'm here for the next couple of days. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe this talk will, will interest you. So um, here we go, now the talk starts. So doing for sustainability what open source did for software. Another title for this talk, if I was giving this talk in a more of an academic domain, I might call it incentivizing investment in efficiency through measurement standards. But that's not as interesting as, as this title. Um, and I've been kind of very fortunate enough to look um, at this space, the sustainability space, for many, many years now and just focus on one question, which is how to reduce the environmental impacts of software. After three years, my answer is kind of very refined. Um, and this talk is my attempt to try and express uh, the answer to all of you. Um, and how to really make a ding, really make a ding in this problem. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about power, but not power as in electricity, power as in power. Then I'm going to talk about measurement. You might have gathered, um, I'm kind of a measurement nerd these days. Uh, you're going to have a lot of little stories uh, throughout, this, throughout this talk. Um, then we're going to bring it together and give you a demo of a tool that's being built through, with the Green Software Foundation community called Impact Framework. And I'll have some time maybe for Q&A at the end, but if we don't have time for Q&A at the end, I'm going to be here wandering around for two days, reach out, chat to me. I'm here to get feedback and, and, and share a story and, and feel free just to stop me and, and, and ask me questions. Um, all right, let's start. Okay, uh, what's this? Anybody know? Everybody worried? Is it going to be a trick question? Go on, someone guess. It's a, it's a hand. You're all wrong, actually. This is a cubit. So this is the distance between the, the fingertip and the elbow. It's a cubit. So it's an ancient Egyptian um, unit of measurement. Although, if you think about it, it probably has been around for a lot longer than that. I don't think the Egyptians invented this. Um, and there's an, there's an Ethiopian proverb that still exists these days, which is send your friend with long arms to the market, which I really like. Um, so just a really quick, quick, quick point. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, is kind of some things are consensus. I'm, I'm very careful. Some things are consensus views of our 68 member organizations. And some things are just my personal opinions and, and my rubrics for life and my first principles. This is my personal opinion that I'm going to kind of go through here, but I'll try and, I'll try and be clear when things are consensus versus my opinion. Um, so power. Let me talk about power. So how do we define power? So power is the ability to influence people and events. I'm speaking at you at an event, so I'm influencing you. So that's an example of power. The person who selected me for this talk had some power. So power is the ability to influence people and events. Um, I would say power, this is my personal rubric again, I would say power is not good or bad. What you do with power is good for some and bad for others. Um, it's not a state also, I don't think of, you know, whoever, however powerless you are, there's people with less power than you. However powerful you are, there's people with more power than you. Um, for me, I think about it as the vectors of force. So there's a force at play that concentrates power into as fewer hands as possible, and there's a forces at play that dilute power into as many hands as possible. When I think about sustainability, I think of it as the fight against the concentration of power and the fight towards the dilution of power. 70 companies are linked to 100% of global emissions. Okay. Um, I think of myself as a side to dilute power, and I think of certain technologies, and I look at certain technologies, and I ask myself, how do they land in this rubric of power? Democracy is a technology, is a tool. 
Somebody woke up one day and said, Gary, I've got an idea. Voting. Terry, shut up, go back to sleep. So, so like democracy is a, is a tool to dilute power. The internet is a tool to dilute power. Knowledge is power. The internet now made knowledge available into all of our hands as a tool to dilute power. My stepdaughter, when she says she's bored, I'm like, are you joking? The entire world's knowledge is available on this little device in your hand and, and you're bored. But yeah, internet is a dilution of power. Blockchain gets a lot of criticism in the sustainability space, but I would also argue blockchain is a dilution of power. When I think of open source, I think of open source as a dilution of power. It's the dilution of power away from the closed source ecosystem that existed before it. And several times in my career, I've had conversations with execs who've been rather upset about an open source project that scuppered their, their plans. And I've had to have conversations with them and I can see the, the moment, the look on their face when they realize they don't have the power that they thought they have. They can't stop it. Someone's just going to fork it. Doesn't matter. Open source is a beautiful dilution of power. That's how I think about it. That's, that's, how, I, that's how I view it. So the sustainability space these days, I think, has a lot of parallels with the closed source ecosystem of decades ago. What do we need in order to dilute the power in the sustainability space the way that open source diluted the power in the software space? And believe it or not, I think the solution is measurement. Um, oh, God. All right, what's this? Woof. Woof. That'd be dog? Wrong. It's a pen and call map, which is, and originally it's a Finnish unit of distance, which was uh, the distance you could hear a dog bark, right? Now, you might think that's a bit of a silly kind of distance measure, because if you're in a wide open space, it'd be longer. If you're in a thick wooded forest, it'd be shorter. But that was the point of it, because it told you information about your terrain, which is useful if you're walking around. Um, so measurement has been used for thousands of years. Oh, this is a, a good quote uh, that I love, which is uh, units of measurements are for the powerful sly tools of subjugation. Each time they're deployed, they turn the world into a place that continues to make sense as long as the power that legitimizes the measurements rests in place. That's a, a, a quote that I think is still valid and has always been valid for thousands of years. So measurement has been used for thousands of years as a tool for manipulating power, for both concentrating power and for diluting power. Let's look at a few examples. Does anybody know where the metric system came from? Yeah? They, yeah, they got a hand up, guaranteed to be French. French? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the French Revolution. So um, lots of people got fed up with King Louis XVI um, for the corruption of his empire. And so he said, you know what? Why don't you write this thing? I'm, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, but the Cahier de Dolions, which was, you know, why don't you write all your grievances to me in a, in a book? So I, you know, just let off some steam, just write it all out. And so the peasantry basically wrote a lot about how the nobility are just screwing us out of money constantly because they keep on cheating with weights. I keep on growing this much corn, taking it to sell, and they're telling me it's a different amount. So it's a constantly, it's a story about, about measurement and how it's used for power. Um, the Cahiers de Dolance didn't make people feel any better and kind of made them even more upset. So it actually triggered the French Revolution and King Louis XVI then lost his head. It's a lot of, a lot of losing heads in this talk. Um, but that actually triggered something. You know, afterwards, they developed a system of measurement which was described as for the people and by the people called a metric system. And to ensure it couldn't be cheated, um, the measurement system was going to be linked to some unalterable attribute of the earth. So a meter is a percentage of the circumference of the earth. Right? You can't cheat that. And actually, a kilo is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube of water. 
Now we know the Earth is not a perfect sphere, and now we also know that depending on where you're on the Earth, that will actually weigh more. But at the time, that was the intention. Um, so what's the conclusion? So yeah, measurement was used as a sly tool of subjugation, but at the same time was flipped into a tool for the people and by the people. Okay? Um, where the, does the term carbon footprint come from? Does anybody know? You're all going to be rather upset. Okay. Uh, one person. So the term was first popularized by British Petroleum, BP, in 2004. Uh, they were getting challenged significantly because of global warming and wanted the response. So they hired the PR firm Ogilvy and Mather to find a solution. Um, and what they created was the carbon footprint calculator. Not to measure BP's carbon footprint, but to measure your carbon footprint. Um, 70 companies in the world are linked to 100% of emissions. But it's a shame we have this global warming problem because of your carbon footprint. All right? It's not your carbon footprint, it's their carbon footprint. I think this is genius. I love this move. I sit and I meditate over this. This is one of the most wonderful chess moves on this board that has, has ever been played. In, they flipped the tables with a single ad campaign 20 years ago. To now the point, I know plenty of people in the, in the startup ecosystem who are building carbon footprint calculators, right? Conclusion. Measurement is the chessboard on which the game of power is being played. If you don't know that, you're the one being played. Okay? So, if measurement is the chessboard, our best move to, delight, to dilute power as I see it is open and transparent carbon reporting, which anyone can do for anyone else. And that's what Impact Framework is all about. Okay, so nothing out there is kind of quite exactly like Impact Framework, so we often struggle to explain it to people. Um, it is a couple of things. It is a custom calculator for environmental impacts, and it's also a file format for communicating environmental impacts. And I'm going to give a short demo, but there's actually some core concepts I need you to understand first. Um, so, impacts are environmental impacts, like carbon, waste, water. The SCI score is, a, is, an, is an impact. Um, that's all the stuff on the right-hand side there. Um, most organizations, you know, either haven't calculated or have calculated and can't and haven't um, figured out how to apportion their impacts down to you or the way the, the methodology or the granularity just isn't useful to you as an end user. So what the community started to do a couple of years ago was to model impacts from data they did have access to. And the data they did have access to, we call those observations. So observations are, is just Data you can observe about your running software system. That's what we call stuff on the left-hand side. And um, impacts are the environmental impacts you want to calculate, like carbon and water. And the process of transforming observations to impacts we call induction. Um, and that's the power of impact framework. Uh, you don't need to be blocked, as a majority of people are kind of blocked right now, because you don't have access to the data. If you just take observations that you do have access to and induce them into environmental impacts through something called uh, a model plugin. So, next concept. Model plugins and pipelines. So, a model plugin is just a small piece of code that takes an observation and enriches it, adjusts it, transforms it somewhat into an impact. So, we've got model plugins. Or there, is, there is a model plugin that can take... Uh, CPU utilization and estimate energy. That's a model plugin. 
Okay. Um, we're not the first to, people to do this. There's been, you know, obviously people have thought in the past about taking some observation and turning it to an impact. But what the the previous incarnations of tools that are like this, they, they chose what we describe as a monolith model. So it was like a take it or leave it approach. This is our computation. Um, if, you, if your use case doesn't fit our model, tough. What the IF community wanted was something a bit more flexible. Um, so we have what we call a micro plugin architecture. You kind of pick and choose the models that you need to compute the environmental impacts for your unique software. And that's the thing that our community figured out over the last couple of years. These monolith plugins, they're not working for me. We, my, my company needs its own pipeline. My web application is a pipeline. My AI application is all unique pipelines. That's, the, that's, where the, that's one of the key learnings that we had. Um, and so we actually like there's, there's been a lot of conversation about the Linux command. That's the kind of literally the way we think about it is you like cat your observations, you pass it to a command, you pipe it to the next, you pass it to the command, you pipe it to the next, you pass it to the command, you pipe it to the next, and then you, you print it out. It's literally a pipeline like that. And just like a Linux command, you can swap ones out very easily to do different things. Um, and that's really powerful for the community because they can customize pipelines for exactly their use case. Right. So now we've got enough, the rest should hopefully make some sense. And this is where this is, is going to get maybe more interesting, but more difficult for me, because I have to figure out how to do a demo. That didn't work. Ah, brilliant. So, um, so how are we going to change the world? We're going to change the world through a YAML file. Right? Of course. So um, I know after, after that whole talk about death and destruction, and I'm about to show you a YAML file, so I kind of get it. But this is, this is how you drive Impact Framework. Impact Framework, the, the computation is described in a YAML file, and the results with all your environmental impacts are stored in a YAML file. Um, I can read these YAML files, um, but I understand a lot of people can't. And anything more than a trivial YAML file needs, needs a lot of work in order to be able to understand what's going on. I'm just gonna scroll quickly down here. And this is, tends to be where I start losing people, but bear with me, I will make it more interesting in a second. So this YAML file here that I'm scrolling down, this YAML file is a computation of a size score for the Green Software Foundation website. Okay, the carbon emissions of our website. So I'm gonna scroll down to the, the this, is all, this is all still configuration and definition of the calculation. I'm going to scroll down to here, there's a tree, and you can see there's a tree structure, and at the bottom of here, we've got something called GitHub Storage for Code. I'm going to dive into this, don't worry about it. This is the, the component, this is, we're trying to, at this stage in the tree, we're trying to compute the emissions from just storing our code in GitHub. What does that look like? This is what we call a pipeline. This is the pipeline of little functions and models that we're going to use to compute that. These inputs are the observations I can observe about this, which is things like the visits to the website, things like that. And if I scroll down even further, we've got some outputs here. And you can see there's some interesting things here like psi and carbon and energy. So we've got some, something there. It's all stored in the YAML file. You define in the YAML file, you can compute it, you can get the outputs all in the YAML file. Is this or generated? Sorry? Is this or generated? This is generated. Okay, but the initial YAML file, you do have to do some, some handwriting to get, to, get it, to get it there. But yeah, I'm not expecting you to write uh, 7,600 7, lines. Okay, so, um, but it's also quite hard to visualize what the hell's going on. I was hoping by the time of this talk, this next thing I'm about to show you would be ready for release, but it's not quite ready yet. So I'm going to show you something that's a bit uh, in, in dev. So um, we've been building a visualizer. And so this visualizer, again, it's just showing that YAML file in a more useful way. It's not doing any computation itself. So you can see here right at the top, uh, this is the GSF website, SCI score. You can see a couple of things, the, the headlines, we are total carbon emissions. This is for the month of August. Total carbon emissions were 2.4 kilos. 
And our SCI score, remember SCI is carbon per something, we chose carbon per, per visit, is 0.129 grams per visit, which is actually pretty good. We, obviously with the Green Software Foundation, we would make sure our website is like as efficient as could be. But um, this is an important thing. It's actually baked into the SCI specification. It's discussed in the SCI specification. These headline numbers, not that useful. What you want, all of the actions that you need to take only come through from getting deep into granular, deep, uh, getting more granular information. So the SCI actually talks about having granular information in there. So you can see here, obviously we've got, this is a time series, so that SCI score has been built with like data over a month. So there's, we've got temporal granularity, but there's also structural granularity here. So you know, we've got the root here of, this is the total emissions for that moment, but we can also break that down. And we've, we've, as you saw, the tree was kind of grouped in different ways. We grouped it in different ways. And straight away here, I can see, um, if I go back to carbon, it might be more interesting. Straight away here, I can see, do you know what? We've got, um, most of our emissions are actually just from the end user browsing our website, which kind of makes sense, right? Our network is not that much, our servers somewhat, development is, is storage costs on GitHub. Already, already I've got some information about where are my emissions, how is it getting stored, how is it structured, where should I be putting time and effort, how is this computation being calculated. You already know what I've even included in that computation. Um, let me dive into development. You, you saw this node before in the tree, GitHub storage for source code. This is the in, this is the emissions from just storing uh, code in GitHub. So I can dive into, the, and so what this is, is what we call a component. So a, a component is just anything that emits emissions in, in any of your software that you, that you create. This is one of the things that emits emissions that we've added in this, is in this camp calculation, which is GitHub storage. Um, you can see the total there, and I'm just gonna dive into one of these points here. Some of this stuff might seem recognizable. We've got the inputs, we've got the pipeline, and we've got the outputs. So again, every single part of this calculation is there. It's not the top line number. This is all the working out, all the receipts. You know exactly how we computed this, okay? So basically all these inputs get passed into the first Plug in, which and all those, all those outputs get passed into this, they get passed into this, they get passed into this, get passed into this, until eventually the output, the last one is the outputs here. And you can see some of this stuff here, we've got psi and carbon. Uh, the UI is not, I was hoping the UI would have a, a slightly different feature by this point, it's showing you the inputs and outputs of the plugins, but we didn't quite get that there, which is why everything's kind of hovering over in weird ways, but, um, but we'll get that shortly. So, um, that's how that works. So now you can kind of know uh, 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 components, inputs and outputs and pipelines. Let me scroll back up to the top so you can see here there's carbon. And it's kind of shooting up and down all the time. This is one of the reasons why I think totals actually make for a very challenging KPI for a software team to work towards because why is it shooting up and down? Because more people have visited our website that day and I kind of want a lot of people to visit our website because the more people that visit our website, the more people know how to make their software greener. So it's not a really very useful KPI in, from that perspective. And that's why the SCI is a more useful KPI. My carbon per visit should be going down regardless of how many people are visiting my website. So you can see here, like even though this is a more stable number, I've kind of got a little peak here. You know, my SCI should be stable. What, what the hell happened on the 15th of August? It was 0.17 and then it went down to 0.12. Like why? Like why did that happen? Um, that's, a, that's T15. Let's scroll down to T15. Um, and we can see here between T15, it's pretty much, it's just the server. You can see here, if you, the server is the one that's increased. So let me dive into there, like what, what, what part of the server increased? Well, we're actually using Netlify and I can see everything else is pretty much the same for the most part. And it's just our Netlify that's increased. Why is our Netlify increased? Let me click into it. I can see here, look, uh, we had five builds on the 15th and the day before 
we only had one build. Right, I've explained it. I know why we've had the peak. We just did more builds that day. Okay, there's nothing I'm gonna do with that particular information for this use case, but at least I've, I've narrowed down with the granular data, I've figured out, I've figured out what the action's gotta be. You've gotta get granular. The advice that we tend to have and the advice, I don't know if we still kept in the specification, but five minutes, we, our belief is like anything below five minutes, you're gonna get more diminishing returns, uh, but it's worth, you can, but with impact frame, you can go, you can have a microsecond, you can have a day, you can have a year, it doesn't really matter, it depends on whatever time series you want. Um, let me get the visualizer. All right. So, you know, are we correct? So if we look at this one, uh, we, we chose this pipeline for GitHub. We chose this pipeline for Netlify. We chose this pipeline for whatever that is. Are we correct? Joseph, the R&D lead, spent a long time. He's a climate scientist with 12 years experience in the, in the Arctic. So he like really put a lot of effort into making sure like this, I'm pretty sure this is a good, a good effort. I don't know, are we correct? Are we not correct? The beautiful part about this is that you can download this and challenge us and edit it. So you can download this, um, our YAML file, go ahead, download it. You can install our tool chain. So this is the YAML file that, that I've downloaded on my computer. Um, let's say I don't agree with Joseph, some of Joseph's uh, coefficients that he's used. Um, right? I don't agree his choice this is a power curve. I'm not going to go into what a power curve is for everybody right now, but it's a, a common thing that we use to compute energy. I don't agree with this coefficient there. I'm going to say it's, I think you got it a bit wrong. Right? And then what I can do is I can just rerun it locally on my computer. I've computed a new manifest file with new impacts, new carbon, everything is new. I can then just push that to, to GitHub, create a pull request and say, Joseph, I think you're wrong. This is why I think you're wrong. These are my numbers. This is my calculation, right? I'm not going to scream at him on Twitter. I'm just going to say, look, here's, this is it. I'm just going to, this is why I think you're wrong. And this is, let's have a conversation about it, right? Um, where do you get all, all those plugins from? I mentioned a whole bunch of plugins there. Uh, so we have a bunch of plugins that are, are baked in. Oh, let me not ruin this. A bunch of plugins that are baked in. Um, but we also have an explorer. So we have like a, a, a place where you can find a, a bunch of uh, plugins that the community members have built. We had a hackathon to start this year. We had a, a 50, 60 solutions with lots and lots of plugins being built. One of my favorite is death. Premature death. So you can actually add uh, this plug into your pipeline at the end of your pipeline, and it will tell you how many people are going to die because of your software. Right? Um, and it's backed. You can click in here, and one of the things we ask is if you've if you if you've done anything, you actually have to back it up with uh, with you know research, and you know you can grab it here. They've got the papers that they use to kind of back up their coefficients for for computing death from from carbon. So it's all backed up, right? Um, and again, if you want anything, you can go to our, our, our the Impact Frame website and everything I just mentioned. If you just go to if.greensoftware.foundation, all of it's there, all the links, all the documentation, um, everything's there. Final thing, just because uh, uh, Joseph got it together yesterday, just, and just also just to express to you, just show you how flexible this tool is. When we ran the hackathon at the start of this year, um, a, a group of 16-year-old kids in California used the Impact Framework to measure Zoom, right? That's how easy this tool is, right? 16-year-old kids computed Zoom's uh, Zoom score. And uh, he, he just represented that as a manifest file. So you can see for this, this, this is a, a, a size score for a 30-minute Zoom call, five-person Zoom call. It was almost half a kilo of emissions, compare that to our website for a whole month, uh, and about 84 per participant. And again, you can dive into that. It's got its own pipeline. It's got its own you know, method of computation, etc. And its own file. You can just download that file and, and fork it, do what you want with it. Um, 
I think that's all I wanted to cover here. Let me double check. Yep. And hopefully if I press this, yeah. All right, brilliant. Okay. So, um, yeah, back to the slides. Right. So, we talked about before about Psi and Psi being like an ISO standard these days that we have right now. Um, and this is not a consensus position of the foundation, but it is a public discussion that's being had right now about turning that YAML format that you saw into an ISO specification. Okay. Um, and I call them uh, imp files. So impact manifest uh, protocol or just like impact. Um, and kind of like, wouldn't it be wonderful if any tool that computes environmental impacts would have a standardized protocol for communicating those impacts to others? There's loads of tools being built right now and they're all just dashboards without any ability to communicate and plug in with each other. Um, sometimes I think of sustainability, the ecosystem of sustainability as the web before HTML and imp files are maybe the HTML that will drive the sustainability ecosystem. Um, and now we're definitely getting into my personal dream territory. This is not kind of anything other than my opinion right now. So my dream is this, this is my personal dream. Every software product in the world will have to be sold with a label that has a Psi score plus and points you to an imp file with the evidence backing up your score. Every piece of food I buy these days is a food label. Why doesn't software, right? Um, the components, you know, the imp file will have all the components, the, your methodology, your computation, your coefficients, your inputs, your outputs, all of it out there. You don't agree with that size score? Guess what you can do? You can take that imp file, you can change the methodology, you can use different plugins, you can do anything that you want and you can publish it back out and say, I think you're wrong. This is why I think you're wrong. Um, every policymaker I speak to is telling me that this, this is what they're looking for. Okay, this is what they're looking for. So I want to just draw this picture. So the, the beauty of IF, if it hasn't quite landed yet, um, is that anyone can compute anyone else's emissions. Okay, you could compute Green Software Foundation's emissions. You could take what you could observe about our organization, create a manifest file and compute our emissions. I can compute your organization's emissions. I can find all the details I can about them, read its financial reports, look at all the public information, the observations of your organization, and compute your organization's environmental impact. Um, remember when BP built a carbon footprint calculator to measure your emissions? We've built a calculator so you can measure their emissions. Yeah. How'd you like them apples? Yeah. Um, but to make this dream come true, we're going to need one more, one more thing. Okay. So a watcher, a watcher is someone, is what we call someone who writes manifest files. We call them watchers. Someone who can take observations and understand how to turn them into, into impacts. It's an expertise. That's the thing we've realized over the last couple of years. It's an expertise. This will be a role three, four years in the future. Um, it's a skill set. It's really not easy. It's really not easy. Um, there's not many people right now who can actually have the skills right now to, to write these manifest files. We know this, at least, in, at least more than trivial manifest files. We know this. We need many, many more watchers. We need tens of thousands of watchers. So the main call to action I have right now is to find what I call the first 10 watchers. So the 10 watchers that myself and Joseph and the other kind of core contributors are going to, going to train up. Train up 
uh, on software measurement with impact framework. And the ask for the watcher in return is to, and our goal is to measure an SCI score for the top 100 open source projects in the world, and then publish those scores and imp files in a repo that we're calling SciDB. Start this open, transparent mechanism of emissions reporting. We feel that open source is a great starting place because it's already open. There's already willingness, there's no secrecy or privacy. If you've got an open source project, what are the emissions of your open source project? And just like I would say the first people kind of tentatively exploring how to write software in an open way, uh, watchers are going to be the first people exploring how to do impact measurement in an open way. We're looking for people ideally with existing experience with software carbon measurement, um, people who are comfortable teaching others, because these first 10 are going to have to teach quite a few others, uh, comfortable writing, comfortable speaking, perhaps even comfortable giving this very talk at a future conference. So if this person is you or you know somebody, you know, that's the link to apply. It's grunsuff.org forward slash watchers. Um, feel free to share it. Feel free to, to, to talk to others about it. Um, I mean, let me leave you with a, 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 a final few thoughts. So impact framework is the solution to opaque carbon reporting. Um, I have a saying. If you're fully transparent, you can't be accused of greenwashing. You can only be accused of being wrong. We're trying to get a mechanism here so people can say that you're wrong. Um, and just one final thing. So uh, what's this? Welcome. Welcome. Almost. This is a, that's very good, actually. But this is actually a fathom. It's the distance between one fingertip to the, to the other fingertip. But it could also possibly be the start of a clap. So that's it. Thank you very much. I, do I have time for questions or should I? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Some crazy over-engineered five-nodes multi-cloud Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. So I'd have to make some guesses. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would not be able to do as good a job as you would do it. Ideally, you would do it, and then publish your own manifest file, and then maybe I can look at it and say I agree or I don't agree. In the absence of you actually doing it. I have something at least I can do, some way of guesstimating it. I might see what you've written. I might, I don't know, try and look at other, other, other places to find, you know, hints of the of the site views. Look at your page rank, things like that. So there's ways it would not be as good as you because you have access to the data. But from what I can observe, I can actually try and make a guess. Yeah. My dream is that I make guesses and you go, okay, that's wrong. Let me take your manifest file and tell you what's right. Other questions? Uh, should I pass a microphone around? Is that? Uh, oh. also Go on. I'll repeat the question. Um, I guess it's really hard to uh, calculate the user uh, yeah, emissions to the user of coding one uh, because when you have a software that's written in a super unresponsive way with an unresponsive language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it could be really Yeah, so I think you have to do some sort of... Mo so everything is really we, we built with Imperfect. It's just a model. So um, what Joseph did with, with our model for it is he just took a, a sample of our, of our website and just measured it locally on his computer using other tools and then built a model to extrapolate that for, for other users. So then we just take the number of site visits and then effectively multiply it by these, by these coefficients. 
So for your, so if you've got software, you've basically got to, to, to find ways of how to, how to model it and measure it some way. So you, you just talked about two pieces of code. You, you actually would probably want to measure, you, you, you kind of want to get to energy. And there's a couple of different ways of doing that. If you've got the methodology or tooling on your system, and it's very hard to find this tooling, if you've got this tooling to actually measure the energy of your software, then you can compute it that way. If you, all you can measure is utilization, because sometimes that's the only thing you can measure is utilization, then there's models you can use which can kind of ex extrapolate that into energy. Or there's just like a, a lot of creativity that needs to happen there as well. We have to start figuring out, well, what is the best way of, of computing this? Because sometimes from an end user device, I don't, I don't know, I can't tell how, as a, as a, as a website owner, I can't find out how much CPU utilization my website is using on your computer because that's private, that's your information. So there's, there's, a, there's a privacy concerns there as well. So a lot of this is really figured out based off of modeling and uh, doing certain experiments and then, and then publishing that out. One of the things that we're realizing is there's common pipelines that can help you compute common sets of information. And that's what we really want the first watchers to, to come along is to help us figure out these questions and then publish those pipelines. My use case, here's my example, here's my manifest file. This is how I computed my end user functionality. These are the models that I use, the pipeline I used. And then you can learn from that. And then if it works for you, it works. If it doesn't, you can maybe change some of those aspects of it. But as I said, none of this stuff is one click install. It will work for you. All of it is how do I figure this out? How do I build a good model? But has that answered your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I think that gentleman at the back was first. Um, so, yeah, for, first of all, you were only talking about like, calculating the insights from the software, right? Yeah. But would the models work also to be like, hey, you drove a car in the company or anything? And secondly, are you into the protection you want to go or do you want to hide the code and just show up to the company and stuff? So, yeah, I mean, we, we, it was really interesting because obviously we're the Screen Software Foundation, so we focused on software that was the whole point of kind of computing this i've been having conversations with a number of other people from other organizations and especially because even there's even members of our foundation who are manufacturers predominantly who have a software arm um, what's really interesting is that this is is very applicable in the physical space as well um, you can build a manifest file to describe anything Right, so it's like a generic format. You might not, you, you might, instead of utilization, you might have weight of aluminium or something like that, and you compute the impacts, um, yeah, on top of it. Um, was that, that was part one of your question. I can't remember what your second part of your question was. Well, we're the Green Software Foundation. We're going to focus like predominantly in this direction. I think uh, moving forward, our founder, we, we will focus more on the measurement of the physical side of the things. But just for the nature of who we are, what we're going to focus on is, is like racks, servers, uh, data centers, things like that. But yeah, it is applicable in kind of a broader domain as well. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, apologize.